Sunday of Lent, we're getting closer and closer to Easter, and our readings are mindful of that, hearing about resurrection in the Old Testament, resurrection in the New Testament with Lazarus. So we know that whatever comes to this body, our Lord has overcome sin, death, the devil. He raises us up on the last day and gives us life now. So our first hymn celebrates that, 420, Christ the life of all the living. Please rise. the life of all the living, Christ the death of death of hope, who thyself for me once giving to the darkest depths of woe, through thy suffering's death and merit, I eternal life inherit thousand thousand thanks shall be dearest Jesus unto thee thou art thou hast taken on thee bonds and stripes are cruel rod pain and scorn were Heaped upon thee, O thou sinless Son of God, thus didst thou my soul deliver from the bonds of sin forever. Thousand, thousand thanks shall be, dearest Jesus, unto thee. Thou hast borne the smiting only, that my wounds might all be whole. Thou hast suffered sad and lonely, rest to give my weary soul. Yea, the curse of God enduring, Blessing unto me securing Thousand, thousand thanks shall be Dearest Jesus unto thee Heartless scoffers did surround thee Treating thee with shameful scorn and with piercing thorns they crown thee. All disgrace thou, Lord, hast borne, that as thine love mightest on thee, and with heavenly glory crown me. Thousand, thousand thanks shall be Dearest Jesus, unto thee. Thou hast suffered men to bruise thee, that from pain I might be free. Falsely did thy foes accuse thee, then I can security. Comfort thus thy soul did languish me to comfort in my anguish. Thousand, thousand thanks shall be, dearest Jesus, unto thee. Thou hast suffered great affliction and hast borne it patiently. Even death by crucifixion fully to atone for me. Thou 
poets chose to be tormented that my doom should be prevented thousand thousand dearest jesus unto thee then for all that wrought my pardon deep and sore for thine anguish in the garden i will thank thee evermore thank thee for thy groaning sighing for thy bleeding and thy dying in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Precious in the sight of the Lord. I love the Lord because he has heard. Because he inclined his ear to me, the snares of death encompassed me, the pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. Then I called in the name of the Lord. For you have delivered my soul from death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for this, the fifth Sunday in Lent, is from Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, 
Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come in to, from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are clean, cut off. This is the word, oh, sorry. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves. O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O oh, come, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame. The epistle is from Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? 
If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know. He will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into this world. When she had said this, she sent, excuse me, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. And now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews, who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled, and he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We invite the children to come forward for the children's message. Good morning, good morning. morning. Anybody else coming from the back? Michael, are you on your way? You're going to like this one, Michael. I got a friend who takes pictures 
of animals in the wild, especially birds. And he gets some amazing pictures of birds in flight. And they're crystal clear. You can see all the detail. But he had a picture the other day of a bird that was down on the ground, but the bird still had its wings out big. Well, you know why a bird might be on the ground but have its wings out large like that? Do you know? It's a predator. It's a predator. Why would a bird on the ground want to have its wings out big? Maybe it's protecting its nest. Could be protecting its nest. In this case, it wasn't its nest. It had something. You know what it had? It had caught something it was going to eat. It had caught something good and tasty that it was going to eat. A fish or a little rodent. And it did not want to share with anybody. And so it had its wings out big to say, look how tough I am. I'm a big bird. You're not going to be able to take what I have. Right? So when we're hungry, if you're really hungry, do you sometimes feel that way? Like you're not going to take my slice of the pizza? I'm going to protect my slice of the pizza. I want to eat my pizza. I want to make sure I get the biggest slice out of the box. You can have the little tiny slice. When we're hungry, do we kind of feel that way sometimes? That our hunger, our flesh, wants to take what's ours and not give it up? So that bird didn't want to give up what it had caught, right? And sometimes even us, when we're hungry and we feel like we need something, we don't want to give it up. And the Bible, our reading, talks about the flesh in two different times. We have the epistle where Paul talks about the flesh and how the flesh, those desires that we have, lead us to sin sometimes, right? Have you ever felt like fighting over a piece of pizza? Yeah, I heard a yes back there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your parents are going to make sure you get enough food, aren't they? No. <laughs> I think you look like you're growing up pretty big and strong and tall, so I'm pretty sure that requires you to be fed well. And I know your parents, and they're good parents, so I'm going to disagree with you on that one, Michael. <laughs> and uh, so your, your parents make sure you get fed. We don't even have to go that far. God promises that he's going to take care of you, right? I know God's going to make sure you get your daily bread. And yet, we're hungry you know that word hangry, where you can get kind of angry because you're hungry? That the passions of our flesh make us do wrong things. Now, Ezekiel comes into a valley where there are just dry bones. There's no flesh at all. Do you have any ideas of why you would have bones with no flesh on them? Because you're not fed. Because <laughs> you're not fed. <laughs> Well, because you stop eating, and then what happens? You die. You die, and then what happens? The birds come, and they pick the bones clean, and they eat all the flesh. They put their wings out big and say, don't you take what I found. I found something amazing. Well, that's kind of scary when you think about it. When you think about how life is, that life means that we hunger and then we die. And you have bones in the valley. But then we hear, what does God say to Ezekiel to do to the bones? What does, he, what does he say? He says, preach a sermon, Ezekiel. Ezekiel looks. Does he have people who are ready to sing hymns? Does he have people who are ready to look at him in the face? It's just dry bones. And he says, you want me to prophesy to preach to dry bones? God says, yep. And so he starts speaking God's words. And what happens? He says there was the rattling of the bones. Can you hear the bones rattling? The bones coming back together like a skeleton. If you heard that noise, would be afraid? I might be afraid if I heard a skeleton coming together. Do you think Ezekiel thought maybe I should stop preaching and run away? The flesh tells us to be scared sometimes. But Ezekiel kept preaching, and the word, the rattling bones came together, and then what came onto the bones? Yeah. The flesh. the flesh came back. 
and they came back to life. Because God's showing that when we hear God's word, it gives us life. That's part of what Jesus says in the gospel, that whoever believes in him, though he die, never dies, but lives in Jesus forever. So that no matter what happens to our bodies after, our die, after we die, God takes our spirit home. And he promises in his prophet that there'll be a new heavens and a new earth where the lion lays down with the lamb and a little child shall lead them. So we know that the way God wants this world to be is not to have fleshly desires that always take us in the wrong direction, make us angry, or flesh that disappears from the bones, but for life to go on forever where we can receive his love forever. And that's the way it will be when he raises us on the last day. And he raises us perfect. So whenever you see one of those things that scare you, and that big bird's got its wings out, say, don't you come near me, I'm tough. You remember that Jesus became a little lamb for us, and he gave his life. So he died. But what happened three days after he died? Yeah. He rose again. He rose again, and he lives forevermore. And we're going to celebrate that in just a few weeks with Easter. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give thanks that we know that no matter what happens in this life, you've overcome death, and you will make it so that the lion and the lamb lay down together. <laughs> lion and the lamb cuddling together. It's hard to imagine, and yet that's the world you have in store. So we pray that we'll live in that hope and with sure faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Eden's got a children's bulletin for you, and we'll sing our next hymn. Yet 
cheerfully to suffering goes that he is false from this night free in her life no house no home my lord on earth might have in death no friendly tomb but what a strange a gift what may i say and was his home but mind the tomb wherein he lay here might i stay and sing no story so divine now was Sweet praise, I all my days could gladly spend. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from the resurrection and the life, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Everyone who lives and believes in me, Jesus says, shall never die. Amen. We avoid subjects that are uncomfortable, none more so than death. When death hangs over us, we don't know what to say. We don't know how to respond. When somebody we meet and love has been given a diagnosis that comes with a countdown of weeks or months left to life, our tongues begin to trip over themselves. And we want to comfort loved ones. But when somebody has passed, especially when it comes at a time that we didn't expect. We go and we see them at the nursing home, and, and what do you say? When it's a situation that you think, that shouldn't have happened. You're like, well, can I say that? How do, what, how do I respond? How many of us have been in that hospital room or been at that nursing home and left and on our way back to the car have sat there and said, why did I say what I said? Would it have been better to have said nothing? Oh, you have to say something, but what do you say? And Jesus was in one of those situations with Martha and Mary. Except in his case, not only were they grieving Lazarus, both of them expressed in their words, Lord, if you had been here, we wouldn't be grieving right now. It's clear that not only does he have to say something to them, he loves them, but they feel upset at him. And so what does Jesus say? Jesus told Martha, Lazarus would rise again. And Martha was not comforted by those words. She makes it clear. She said to him, I know, I know. It's going to be a while, the last day, then he will rise. Amen, Jesus. But the last day is far away, it seems. I mean, it could be minutes away, but we don't know. So it could be a millennium away. What does that resurrection on the last day do for my grief right now and for however long? Jesus, I know, Martha says, and is not consoled. Now, before we go any further, I, I want to step out of this and just say, thank God that we have a God who is spoken to like this, because he deserves all praise and honor and glory, right? And he could say, no, you're not going to talk to me this way. But never in all of the Bible... When we come to him with this frustration and this inconsolable feeling, does he say, no, 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 here's the script. You say, praise Jesus, amen. That's what you say. No, from the very beginning of scripture, Abraham questions him. God, you know, uh, we've been doing this, you told me I'd have an air thing now for decades. It hasn't happened. 
God answers his questions. And Abraham bargains with him. What if there are only 20 righteous people? What about 15? You keep going through the scriptures. Job. Job is on the last nerve of his faith. And he comes right up to the edge of saying, God, it's all your fault. His wife tells him, just curse God and die. We have Solomon penning, everything in life is vanity. And that's Holy Scripture. And we have Martha turning away from Jesus' comfort and saying, I know. And all that looks ahead to Good Friday, right? When the Son of God himself will be nailed to a cross and say, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why? Why? In our place, the Son of God cries out. And I think that's the first lesson. What words we can speak in the face of death. If we want to, take the comf- if we want to comfort the grieving, to take them some peace, Appearing to have all the answers doesn't seem to do the trick. Even when Jesus does have all the answers, it doesn't comfort those who say, you may have the answers, but I feel loss. That's what's ever present right now. Now, to be clear, John's Gospel says there were a lot of people there to console Martha and Mary. It doesn't say that Jesus went to console them. And a lot of sermons can pass their first hurdle just by asking this question. What would Jesus do in this situation? But in this situation, Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And we're very unlikely to be able to do that for people we love. I'm not going to put a limit on God's miracles. He can do whatever he wants. And maybe he's got another one of those resurrection miracles up the sleeve somewhere, and praise God if we get to see it, right? Both Paul and Peter got to raise somebody from the dead. But I'm not expecting it, because it's been a while since Paul and Peter. I'm expecting we're going to have to do other work to console. And I'm not sure Jesus was aiming to console when he said to Martha, your brother will rise again. He was teaching teaching Martha, perhaps, but more than that, he was teaching all of us because he said that's what's, he told the disciples why he was going and why he was delaying. I'm doing this so that you'll believe. And that's what the text says at the end. Because this happened, a lot of people believed. So even would we be able to work a miracle? Only Jesus can teach this amazing statement I am the resurrection and the life. Only he is. Now, Jesus could have come before Lazarus died. He knew about it. He had time. He could have gotten there. He didn't. And he could have come in order to console Martha and Mary after Lazarus died. I can imagine it. Jesus coming up to Martha, embracing her with a wordless presence that communicates peace that surpasses all understanding and makes clear, I grieve with you without a word. The grieving need to grieve, and it is lonely work. So to have someone who doesn't come to you and say, we've got to stop you from grieving, what can I say that'll put the grief away and you'll have a smile on your face? To have somebody who doesn't try and stop you from grieving, but just says, I will grieve with you, that is love. And Jesus could have done that. He actually could have stopped the grieving immediately. He could have gone to the tomb first, showed up to Martha and Mary's house with Lazarus in tow. Look who I found, guys. But that's not what Jesus did, either of those things. And the Bible doesn't describe Jesus hugging. There's the moment where the little children come to him and he takes them in his arms and he blesses them. So that might be close. A lot of the times when Jesus touches somebody, you know what happens? Healing. There's even a situation where he's just walking along and somebody is too afraid to touch him because she's unclean by Jewish standards. So she tries to just get the bottom 
hem of his robe. And it says the power went out of him. The life went out of him. And she was healed. So Peter's mother-in-law lay with fever. Jesus took her by the hand, lifted her up, and healed her. A leper comes to Jesus. And again, it would be unclean to touch a leper according to regular Jewish laws. But Jesus touches the leper, a man who's not been touched by anybody. That's from the moment he was diagnosed, right? He touches the leper, and the leper is healed. So Jesus is not physically aloof by any means. We describe him as a man who lived physically, lovingly with people. The point is, is that so much of Jesus' healing came through that touch that he is bringing new creation in his body because he is the resurrection. He is the life. It's like the question that was asked of Jesus in one of the other Gospels, why his disciples didn't fast. Because there's so many other religious movements at the time, and they were all making use of fasting in one way. One group would fast on Mondays and Wednesdays, another on Tuesdays and Fridays, right? There's all these different kinds of fasting to discipline the flesh, because we need to discipline the flesh. And they said, Jesus, why are your group of disciples not fasting? You know, why is it such an easy thing to be a Jesus disciple? He said, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then my disciples will fast. And he might have also said, and then they will also have to console each other. For we live between the time when Jesus lifted up the ill and made them whole just by touching them, and the last day when the resurrection will touch everybody, every dry bone, and death will be gone forever, once and for all. Now, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So he is the fountain of new life. No less so than when he was at Lazarus' tomb. No less so than on the last day when he comes in the clouds with glory. He is the new fountain of new life. He is the touchstone of new creation. He is the bridegroom who brings feasting and joy. And why then does that bridegroom weep at Lazarus' tomb? I think I've got about a dozen John commentaries. I love John commentaries, so I keep collecting them. I've read all sorts of explanations of why Jesus weeps. Shortest verse of the Bible. I love to give that verse as memory work after a vacation confirmation. Because the kids come to me and they're like, you gave us memory work on vacation? I'm like, you didn't look, did you? Just two words. Jesus wept. I hope confirmants were paying attention to that. So why did Jesus weep? And there's all sorts of theories about why he wept. I'm pretty sure it's not because he had confirmation memory work. But people say that it could be this, it could be that. I mean, Jesus knows it's about to happen. But it says he was deeply moved for all this. And I think the best answer to this takes the commentary of the people who were there. When they look at Jesus weeping, what do they see? See how he loved him. He wept because of his love. We weep at death because love is interrupted. And how Jesus felt all that exactly, we, we're not going to be able to understand it fully because he loves without any shades of sin and he loves eternally and he loves at a level that we're only scratching the surface of. He loves eternally, he loves perfectly, he is the life and that life is his love. Those who were there saw deep love in his tears. And he doesn't just love with us. He doesn't just proclaim, I am the resurrection of life. He doesn't just bear our questions. And he answers some of the questions, but he comes with his own question. If we're going to have a God who will bear our questions, then we'll be ready when he questions us in return. And he asks Martha, and he asks us, do you believe? Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe? It's similar 
It's from Luke 18. The question that just hangs in the air. And Luke's passage begins with the explanation. He told them a parable to the effect that they always ought to pray and not lose heart. And he tells a parable about a widow who comes before an unrighteous judge who doesn't want to do anything good. He just wants to use his office to get his own things. And the judge is specifically called unrighteous. So this is a prayer parable that imagines God as unrighteous. It can't be right, right? I mean, Jesus' parable is, is, is like, don't give up hope, even if you think God is unrighteous, which none of us think, but do you believe, right? And at the end of the parable, he says, I tell you, God will give them justice speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? It's that question again. I know what you're going through. I'm going through it with you. I know what it is to hang on a cross and say, can you let this happen and be a righteous judge? But do you believe? If death is for our final chastisement, an end to our sinning, so that we might be remade bone upon bone, flesh upon bone, skin upon flesh, a new life through it all, then what is this life before that resurrection for? And we might ask that question with an edge to it. Why so much suffering in this life, God? Why not heal Lazarus so he never dies? Why so much time before the last day? Why injustice everywhere we look? And God answers the question with a question. Do you believe? If death is for transition, sloughing off bodies which haven't been able to express the being that we feel capable of but is always just out of reach, that we're not home in our own flesh, then this life is for faith. In the epistle, John explains, this is the victory which overcomes the world, our faith. So when in the midst of suffering and injustice and Job sees the resurrection and the life and sings, I know my Redeemer lives. Amen. That moment, that faith is the victory which overcomes the world. And I ask you this, what is the miracle of our gospel reading? Is it that Lazarus rose from the dead because he's back in his tomb waiting for the last day today? Or is it that Martha and so many believed, and believing in Christ, though they die, they never die. And they live forevermore. They believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Amen. See, belief is a victory over this world. It's not instant consolation. It doesn't make everything go happy and rainbows. Remember, Jesus once said, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. But woe to you who are rich, because you've already received your consolation. If not everything is consoled right now, if not everything feels right, if not everything has an answer, blessed are you, for you have life in Christ Jesus. Belief is the evidence of things unseen, unfelt, unknown, unanswered. And it's victorious over this world because the passions of this world are drifting away like chaff in the wind. They don't remain. No matter how real they feel in the moment, they go. But faith is a lifeline, an anchor beyond the veil to the last day reeling us in to home. Brothers and sisters, in this time in between, it's good to console one another. And sometimes the Spirit will give you just the words to speak. Sometimes not. Sometimes there won't be any words to speak. Sometimes it will be a reminder, the guarantee of the last day, and you'll be able to quote just the right verse. Sometimes it'll be to look to Jesus on the cross. Because Jesus' compassion went beyond tears. Far beyond tears. He who is the resurrection and the life 
embraced death for us. He who could have lived forever laid down his life at age 30. None of the rest of us can say, I am the resurrection and the life. But in Christ, we can say he is. And he gives us that perfect life. We are cleansed. And this is the only reason faith overcomes the world. Not because faith is anything to boast in. No, it's Christ who takes our faith up graciously and makes it righteousness and life and rewards we are only beginning to see. So all praise to him, our Lord, our life, Jesus. Amen. May the peace of God which surpasses all understanding and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Son, and you sent your spirit, sustain us while we await Christ's attention to our present needs. Give strength to our prayers, heal our weaknesses, restore all our losses. Give us faith throughout our days in Jesus. For he is the resurrection and the life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, breathe your life into your church that she may stand by your strength and live according to your word. Lay your hand on men of every era to proclaim your word and to bring life to the downtrodden, the faithless, the fearful, and the outcasts. We pray for our sister congregation, risen Lord of Taylorsville, and their pastor, John Mueller. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you visited your creation in your Son. Grant that our homes would always receive him. The husbands and wives and brothers and sisters would rejoice to hear his promises steadfastly believing them and ever living in their life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of all, you are the true source of life, which you give through the power of your spirit. 
humble those who are given authority over the lives of our people, that they would discharge this duty honorably and accord with your will. Bring peace where there is war. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, the ones you love are ill and need your holy care. We cry out to you for Becky, Tammy, Janice, Marianne, Barb, Emily, Fred, Mark, Joni, Jim, Debbie, Luella, Brad, Roger, Betty, Todd, Charlotte, Charlie, Ruth, Don, Alicia, Kathy, Ronald, Elizabeth, Scott, Gil, Brad, Douglas, Sandy, Victoria, Charlie, Kevin, Jordan, Melissa, Artinian, Vicky, Bobby, Teresa, Mark, Judy, Bridget, Sarah, Laverne, Storm, Aiden, Tom, Ted, Kathy, and Jack. Make haste to help them. Spare their lives. And last day, call them from their graves and unite them to you and all your saints. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Father, in baptism you have given the new birth of water and the Spirit. Make your children strong in your spirit that they may shun the works of the flesh and live in this world expecting the resurrection and the life of the world to come. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, giver and perfecter of our faith, we thank and praise you for continuing among us the preaching of your gospel, for our instruction and edification. Send your blessing upon the word which has been spoken to us, and by your Holy Spirit increase our saving knowledge of you, that day by day we may be strengthened in the divine truth and remain steadfast in your grace. Give us strength to fight the good fight, and by faith to overcome all the temptations of Satan, the flesh, and the world, so that we may finally receive the salvation of our souls. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Ah.
Congregation may be seated. We have a few announcements. We have one more uh, Wednesday night service in Lent. Uh, we will be finishing our Who Done It series by looking at Judas Iscariot. Iscariot means a strong one. Uh, then he turned out to be the strong apostle. And was he to blame for Jesus' death? What were his motives? And uh, what was the opportunity that was given to him? So we'll be examining that in the Who Done It mystery series, uh, Judas. And we'll even talk a little bit about Satan entering Judas and spiritual warfare. So join us this Wednesday, either at 5 o'clock or 7. The meal in between the service starts at 6.45. Other announcements people want to bring to our attention? The meal starts at 5.45 or 6, not 6.45. Good point. <laughs> Time change. I'm still getting used to it. On one of my thoughts. <laughs> Jason. Yeah, we uh, please come next Saturday at 10 o'clock for the Easter filming party. How many of you signed up? We are. There will be lunch served afterwards. And on the next Saturday, we are having the Easter egg hunt at 1 o'clock here at church. Please all come. Thank you for making food for that and making the arrangements. And uh, we can still use some candy, I think. I think we can still use some candy. You bring some candy and fill the eggs, that'll be good. Other announcements people want to bring to our attention, Charlie? Again, our supplies for a food box are getting low, so if you uh, think about it, if you want to buy it, uh, there's a list on the kitchen door of what kind of food items you can eat. So we're going to bring the food to you. Thank you. Charlie? Uh, you could pick which of you goes first. If anybody wants to help put uh, down walls or do a few things around here, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Here we are not helping out. You can go get the lunch and have a soup. What was that? I can go get pizza and have some white people to stay. <laughs> We get enough people working. We might be able to get done in a half hour. Thank you. 